Lauren Snell here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, a podcast where we provide the tools, the tactics, and the strategies to grow your high intensity training business. This is episode 405. And this is the Pre-Rec Conference live podcast and Q&A with Tim Detman of Keyser Australia. Who is Tim? Tim Detman is first and foremost a physiotherapist. He will share today his experiences as a clinician, but also as a researcher, a PhD supervisor, a media presenter, and as a director of Keyser Australia. As the second employee of Keyser in Australia way back in 2006, Tim has extensive experience in high intensity training and how it applies to the Australian population. As a clinician, he will bring a unique perspective to working with injuries, but his underlying passion is to get the average Australian to understand and believe that strength training equals health. So welcome, Tim. Thanks for uh, joining me today. Thank you very much for for having me, Lawrence, and thanks for that kind introduction as well. You've done a little bit of research in the background. Well, I've got to give uh, Luke some credit for that, I think. No, it was yourself, actually, that sent me that bio, so, uh, but it's great bio, so I read the whole thing there. And uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast, um, great to have you. And I just want to say thanks, firstly, to the DS team um, and obviously the rec team for help setting this up and very grateful for the opportunity. It's quite an honor being here right now in front of you all. Uh, it's very overwhelming. Apologies if I, when I came in today, I, uh, I had to just almost head straight to this room because I was running late because there was this accident on the, on the main road there. And I was very, very nervous so and anxious. So thank, thankfully I'm here and it's all going well, which is great. And so, Lawrence, I'd love to echo your words as well. I think it's such a wonderful thing that Discover Strength does to put this on for, for our community. We love at Keyser Australia uh, connecting with our really low, close partners at Keyser in Europe. And I'm often on the phone to them or to Teams and Zoom. Uh, and it's been great to be able to add so many American colleagues to that group as well because... You know, you guys have uh, so much knowledge and so much history um, in this type of training that really, I've got a million questions for you guys uh, over this weekend, so really looking forward to it. Excellent, thank you for that. So the way this is gonna work today is we're gonna do two halves, and obviously we've got the hour, um, or 22 minutes of the first half left, where I'm gonna explore Tim's background myself, um, ask questions about keys of training and the business, but spend most of the time on the exercise and keys unique approach to improving clients' pain, chronic disease, and overall health. The second half of this, I'll open up to questions. So if you have a question that gets triggered at the beginning, just try and remember it, and you'll get the opportunity to ask it in the second half. I just felt that was probably the best way to do this today. Um, so that's how we'll do questions. All right, so let's get straight into it, Tim. So. Let's start with your background. Let's just get into that. Tell us uh, how you got started as a physio and we'll go from there. Well, I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist, which is a physical therapist uh, here in the States. And when I was studying, uh, my aspirations were to be a physical therapist for an elite sports team. Uh, like many physiotherapists, certainly in Australia, uh, that's what I was chasing. And what I realized in my second year of study is whilst I would still love to do elite sports, if I didn't go into elite sport, someone else would. And they would do a really good job, as good a job as I would have at rehabbing hamstrings or rehabbing shoulders or or doing strength and conditioning. But the more I learned about the Australian population and how, unfortunately, how unhealthy they are, my passion shifted to how can I change Australia's attitude towards exercise? Then as my expertise grew, uh, my interest went towards strength training. Um, The founder of Kiza in Australia, Gary Harley, happens to be a very, very good family friend of mine. And so when he brought the concept to Australia first, he said, Timmy, I'd love you to come down and have a look at this new strength training equipment that I've got. And uh, a week later, I was the second employee, Lawrence. Okay. Okay. How did you make that transition? Because obviously we know a lot of like physiotherapists can be quite uh, reluctant to kind of embrace that the, the, the role that strength training can play. Um, and I'm just curious how you, you kind of made that transition because obviously I'm assuming you've kind of gone through that journey where you've realized that not a lot of, not all physiotherapy interventions aren't that beneficial. You're not, we're not saying that, but there's some of them maybe are not that productive and that actually, you know, our strength training approach kind of solves a lot of problems there. So how was that transition for you, just out of curiosity? Well, this might be a difficult answer because, you know, we're talking about three different countries now. We're talking about the UK and, and the US and Australia. And so what I'll say about Australia is that in the university degrees of physiotherapists in Australia, 
we are taught that the most powerful intervention that we have is exercise. Full stop, bar none. That research that everybody in this room knows has been coming out for the last probably 40 years. It's accelerated over the last 20. It's accelerated again over the last five. What we realised at Keyser Australia is that the physiotherapy industry, certainly within our country, doesn't really have the resources or traditionally doesn't have the resources to be able to apply a progressive overload strength training program. Most physio clinics, where they do a wonderful job of rehabbing people and certainly do an awesome job in the early stages of rehab, are a couple of treatment rooms and a relatively small rehab part out the back and that might be a swiss ball and a couple of light weights Mm -hmm. but all of the research is suggesting that moderate intensity high intensity strength training is the type of training that we need to do so i don't think that i made a transition in my way of thinking from a research point of view i just looked at the physiotherapy industry and thought i think that we need to change the way we need to do it from a resource perspective So another one of my business partners, Tony Smith, we're in a discussion one day and I said, Tony, I think this is the future of physiotherapy, to have a physiotherapy clinic and a really, really good strength training facility together. I wasn't the first one to come up with the idea. There's heaps of them in Australia, but they tend to be single sites here and there. And so Keyser Australia is the first place to do it at scale. And you've got a 50-50 physio strength training ratio in Australia, is that accurate? Yeah, so that's about the the ratio of our business. Um, A a typical Kieser clinic employs six physiotherapists, eight to 10 exercise scientists. Uh, At Kieser South Melbourne, as an example, we have uh, 1,100 members who come in and train on our equipment regularly. And we built that over the years by talking to people about the benefit of strength training predominantly for back pain, loans. The, the lumbar extension, the medical lumbar extension exercise has really been the cornerstone of our business from day one when we started it. It's the biggest point of differentiation. We are absolutely, every single day of the week, we are a medical clinic and, and that's what makes us different to a lot of other people in the market mm-hmm. in Australia. So that's interesting. So you just went for the one problem. Like that was like, is that like the Trojan horse for then being able to solve other problems as well? People come in with lower back pain, stay for, you know, better health span, you know, less chronic disease, all the rest of it. Yeah, I don't know how much of um, Werner Keyes' quotes you've read, Lawrence. But I just do some verbatim there. Yeah, yeah. basically, Werner speaks beautifully about what happens when you try and become um, everything to everyone. Mm. Um, it'd be really easy for us to put treadmills into Kiza. Really easy. It'd be really easy for us to put free weights into Kiza. And people would get good results with them. But we are, we are one thing. We are strength training. We apply that to different populations in that some populations have pain and some populations are trying to prevent it. Some populations are trying to prevent anti... Oh, sorry, perform anti-aging exercise. But if you looked at any of the advertising and marketing for us in the early years it was all about back pain 80 percent of the population is going to have back pain at any point in time 18 to 20 percent has it today if you were going to target one patient group and help someone i I would pick the biggest musculoskeletal problem in the entire world Mm -hmm. where we have probably the best intervention in my biased opinion I think no. I think it's a great lesson, you know, regarding mm-hmm. marketing and the, the the one of the challenges we have is that we know our solution helps solve so many problems, and to be disciplined to focus on one thing and really speak to that, and which is going to going to really resonate with you know your target market's biggest problem, is it's difficult to do, but it's probably the most productive way to market. So it's interesting that you had so much success doing that. Yeah, and like you alluded to, when people came in the door, we could talk to them about the longevity benefits of strength training. They came in because of back pain and then they might have had a diagnosis of osteoporosis as as well. They might have had type 2 diabetes. We could talk to them about all of those benefits. But if I put out 
an ad or if I put a sign on the window of any Keys of Australia that says we can help all of these things, well, we've got the greatest intervention in the world, so I'd have to list 55 different things. And it just confuses people. So, yeah, yeah we've, we've focused on back pain and it's, it's been the cornerstone of, of us building up. You know, I don't want to spend obviously too much time on business because I do want to get into exercise, but I do want to ask you one more question about this, uh, which I think might be interesting to a lot of the uh, the audience and listeners. You get you say you get a lot of referrals from doctors. Can yeah. you speak about that? How how have you managed to achieve that? I, I, I love this topic. I'm super passionate about this. I'm going to be you know jumping up and down. It's really on my high horse here. Um, and it, it's hard to know where to start. Everybody in this room knows the health benefits of exercise increasingly so do our clients as they have greater access to educational resources through Google and stuff like that. The research in the last five to 10 years has been much more oriented towards the health benefits of strength training. So early days, we would get a few referrals from doctors uh, for back pain. We built a reputation of doing a really good job for people who had chronic, hard to move, lower back pain. Mm. And as a physiotherapist, and perhaps that's what might be of interest to people in the room, as a physiotherapist, if I see a patient who has been referred by a doctor, then when that person comes in, I send that doctor a letter. And when that person finishes their course of treatment, I send that doctor a letter. And so we started reaching out to a few doctors and then a few doctors really liked what we did. And so we went to them and said, hey, have you got a few other patients with back pain? And so they sent a few more patients in with back pain. So we went from getting a few medical referrals to getting a few more. And then we realized that the medical profession is actually screaming out for someone to perform strength training that they trust. And that last Mm. little bit is super important. Doctors and surgeons know the benefit of strength training. A lot of them just don't have someone that they trust to be able to refer to. And so if I'm a doctor or a surgeon and I have to put my reputation on the line to refer out, then I'm only referring out if I've got someone who I trust. And if I don't, I actually might not refer out at all. Because I'm worried that that patient's going to get a, a negative result or an adverse reaction. And we all know that if you don't apply exercise correctly, it can make your pain worse. Absolutely. I don't shy away from that at all. So we built trust with those doctors. And then we went to them and said, hey, we know that you're referring 10 people in but only sometimes only five of those people actually come to the clinic because patients don't always follow doctor's advice. So then we worked with the doctors, collaborated with the doctors and said, hey, how can we make this easier for you and for your patients? And so in 2022, sorry, in 2021, we had uh, just under 4,000 referrals in a year from doctors. In 2022, we had 6,000 referrals from doctors. Just take one step back. How did you actually get them to successfully get the client to take action? We tailored that uh, to each doctor. So sometimes the, all the doctor said was, oh, it'd be great if I had a, um, a pamphlet. And that's all I needed. Mm-hmm. Some doctors were like, I would really like to be able to refer to a person's name. So I want to be able to refer to Lawrence. I don't want to ref- be able to refer to just Keezer or myself. I want to refer to Lawrence. They wanted that personal connection. Some doctors, and we, we do a lot of this now, some doctors said, hey, can you call the patient and book them in? And that's where, that's the intersection for me of business and health outcomes. So us being willing to think about, let's call it marketing, think about marketing differently and do one little thing extra, make a phone call. Follow up, yeah. It results in a better health outcome for that patient, that patient that wasn't gonna come in, that was just gonna sit on the couch after their total knee replacement. All of a sudden we made a phone call, we made it easy for them, we created the path of least resistance and now they're in. And when they're in and they start to get positive outcomes, their health goes through the roof. But we needed to find a way to take out the barriers and and there were some really interesting barriers 
Just to clarify a couple of things about this, does the doctor become a client of yours so that you can build that trust first at the beginning? The, um, the, if a doctor trains with us, it's much more likely that they will refer to us. Yeah. So we invite every single medical practitioner to come in. And um, every medical practitioner um, that we invite in, you know, we offer them a membership and we say, hey, I would never expect someone to refer to a treatment that they've never tried or that they don't know anything about. So, hey, the Australian Physical Activity Guidelines say that every single person should do strength training twice a week and there's no uh, disclaimer for doctors being excluded from that. So how about you come and do strength training twice a week? And some of our doctors um, know a lot about strength training and so they're really keen to be involved from day one and uh, some other doctors don't know a lot and they so they come in and trial it and they think that oh it's just a gym and it's really hard for us to explain that without bringing them in so we say come in trial it for yourselves and yeah you're right we get more patient referrals from doctors who are training with us okay so just starting to now segue into exercise a bit more specifically um one of the notes you you shared with me ahead of this is that when you train a new client high intensity often you start patients out from a very low intensity first i'm curious why and what does that initial programming look like when you take on i guess not just lower back clients but any patient who maybe is you know you know requires more of a careful uh, beginning with you. okay yeah so let me be clear in answering this question my number one priority is to have that client training long term mm -hmm. and that might mean that i'm not really that worried about what intensity they train at today I care if they train 1% harder tomorrow or next week or their weights are 1% higher. But the population that we're dealing with, which is really important to understand, is average age of a Kiza client is 57. Most people have never been into a strength training facility before. They certainly haven't been into a gym for 20 years. A lot of them are coming in with pain. I want them to get results long term. Sometimes the question I throw back to people is, what would be the benefit what's the benefit versus the risk of me training them really hard on day one so knowing that they don't have a lot of experience we say well let's just train them let's get them started on the program train them at whatever intensity they feel comfortable with let's meet them where they're at and then progress them over time what does that look like it, it can look completely different for different people i mean i have used every piece of medex equipment on the lowest weight possible probably except for the leg press uh, you're talking about your own workouts now no 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 <laughs> i'm trying to be funny Failing. it was good no i liked it and i think the crowd should know that they're allowed to laugh at your funny jokes <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> i appreciate it <laughs> Um, I, I've literally used every piece of equipment except for the leg press on the lowest weight possible because that's what I think a patient needed. Mm -hmm. I have had to stand next to pieces of equipment and coach and encourage and beg for patients to hop on it because they're so scared. I think keeping in mind that I've got a pain population who's coming into the clinic, often people who are really acute, often people who are post-surgical or trying to avoid surgery is very different to what I imagine are the people coming into a lot of the clinics um, of the owners sitting in front of us today. So yeah, coming back to where I started, I'll put them on whatever intensity they need to. If it's a lower limb injury, then I can start them on a higher intensity on mm -hmm. their upper body. Um, but my number one priority is not to get them to train hard. My number one priority is to get them to train long term. Mm -hmm. Can you give us like a, maybe a quick case study, like an individual that comes to mind, you had to start with this type of approach, what that looked like, if there's one that comes to mind? Yeah, okay, so I'll use a, I'll use a back pain example. Yeah. I'll give you a bit of a, a patient life cycle at Keys Australia. Someone comes in with an acute flare-up of chronic lower back pain, mm -hmm. okay? They're in a pretty bad way. They can't bend very much. We see them for a physio assessment at the start, and we do whatever hands-on physiotherapy they need and that that might be some um, uh, education and advice often uh, it's often a bit of hands-on treatment to try and reduce their pain like acutely yeah 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 and and what, what kind of advice and education 
mostly around the fact that, hey, long term to prevent this, you need to be doing some strength right. training. <laughs> so you're pre selling the strength training. But also, <laughs> in, in the short term, um, we have to break a lot of myths. People are told, oh, I've, you know, I was trying to bend down, I was, sorry, I was trying to pick someone, something up without bending my back. Mm. And I think about that and I think, oh, gee, we've got a long way to go in education, pa- educating patients. Like your spine's designed to move. Use the muscles. Um, take some load off everywhere else. Like spread the load across all the joints of your body. That's the safest way for you to move. So I'm trying to understand where they're at initially. I'll do whatever hands-on treatment I need to. And then as soon as possible, um, get them onto the lumbar extension at a low weight. And for those really acute patients, I won't test them the first time I put them on the lumbar extension exercise. I might put them through a couple of sessions first and then whenever I feel like the value of testing them outweighs the risk of flaring them up further, then I'll test them. So I'm trying to test them as early as possible to give them a baseline. They'll then do a spinal program at Kiza. So a spinal program with us is uh, typically, as a starting point, it's 12 LE sessions over six weeks. What that might look like is that someone starts with mostly physiotherapy and a little bit of exercise in those sessions. By the end of a spinal program, it's mostly exercise, maybe a little bit or even no physiotherapy at all. And by a, a more exercise, what I mean is we'll do the LE and then we'll go and do uh, hip abduction and we'll go and do hip adduction and we'll get them onto torso rotation as well. Okay. And we'll in- introduce those one at a time, monitoring their recovery really, really closely because mm-hmm. I get 50% of my information in the session. How does that feel? Where are you feeling it? How hard is it? How easy is it? And I get 50% of my information afterwards. How did you recover? What were your symptoms like that evening? What were your symptoms like the next day? Okay. Interesting. Anything at, else? Well, at the end of that or towards the end of that, um, our clients would then transition into our exercise science, in with our exercise science team. And our exercise science team takes over the late stage of rehab, but also the long-term strength training as well. So I'll have the, the conversation with a patient to say, hey, you need to continue this strength training not only to prevent your back pain coming back, but for because you've got a family history of um, type 2 diabetes and your GP has currently told you that you're pre-diabetic. And they say, well, how long do I need to do it for? And I say, you need to do this for twice, twice a week for the rest of your life. The first time they laugh at that a little bit, and then I look at them straight in the eye and I say, no, you need to do it twice a week for the rest of your life because this is the best thing that you can do to live an active and healthy life going forwards. And whatever orthopedic or metabolic condition we're talking about, strength training is the best thing that you can do. Why do you think people think that? Why do you think people say, how long do I have to do this for? Why have they got that mindset? I've always wondered. I think there's a number of reasons. I think the fitness industry has a fair bit to say about it. I get really frustrated at eight-week boot camps right. yeah. and things like that. I think that... Australia, I'll comment on Australians. I won't say anything bad about the Americans or the English. Uh, yeah, you better not. Australians are very good at dealing with a problem uh, if they can feel it. So one of the reasons that we decided uh, that we would focus on back pain is when people are in back have back pain, they're looking for a solution. <clears throat> when someone doesn't have that back pain, no. they can forget about it very quickly. So we also contributed to that as physiotherapists because we were trying to fix people. We don't even use that language at Keys Australia anymore. My role as a physiotherapist is to try and make someone as healthy as they possibly can be for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And if that means step one is get rid of your back pain, that's fine, I'll deal with your back pain to start off with. Long term, it's about be as healthy and therefore as happy as you possibly can. It's interesting. It's almost like people have like an optimism bias. Like they, they think, oh, well, if nothing's wrong with me, I'll be fine. Um, fitness is hard. It takes it takes hard work. It's uncomfortable, and then that optimism bias kind of goes out the window when they've got sudden acute pain in the way of low back pain or whatever, which yeah, I'd opens say, the door to that conversation. Yeah, exactly. What what you just finished with there is really important. I think it does open that door yeah. to that conversation. People are much more. Uh, receptive to hearing that uh, when they are in, when they've got some pain, and we can talk to them about their long-term future. Right. At that point, I think an interesting 
insight, Lawrence, is that certainly in Australia, over COVID, when there was so many lockdowns and you weren't able to travel and you weren't able to go to restaurants and sometimes you weren't even able to go and see your family and your friends, people realised that the most important thing that they have is their health. And that's, I think, changed the mindset of a number of Australians, certainly Australians over 50. And and I think also that's influenced the number of referrals we get from doctors because they also understand that all of those other things don't matter. If your knee's so sore that you can't walk, then you're not going on a cruise and you're not going down to the park to play with your kids or your grandkids. So... First and foremost, look after yourself and look after yourself for, for the long term. It's been a big change. Yeah, interesting. I love that sort of protect the asset mindset. Um, so now's the opportunity. If you guys got any questions, um, please yeah, raise a hand. And uh, do you want to, yeah, so start with yourself self there, Tasso. Um, uh, go ahead. My first question is, uh, do you have a formatted prescription pad or prescription sheet that you give to the doctor to either give the client or to give to you back with their information on it. Tim, do you want to repeat that back just for the podcast? Or? Yeah, so the question was, do we have a formatted prescription pad uh, that we give to the doctors and that we ask back from the doctors? The answer is yes. The follow-up question is, how often does it get used? The answer to that is not very much. <laughs> and Tessa, the... The important thing for us at Keyser Australia is we're trying to build a relationship with those doctors and genuinely try and get the best result for their clients. And sometimes that means making the life as easy as possible for the doctors. And so for some of those doctors, they're like, that's great if I've got a prescription pad, I can write down what I need. For other doctors, that makes life harder and they just want to be able to say, hey, you need to go and do strength training and I trust the guys at Keyser Australia, so go and do it there. And that's the simplest way for them to do it. But I think that philosophy of, or our philosophy of, what can we do to make that process smoother and easier for everybody involved? That's my big picture answer to your question. And do you try to set up a system within the office where maybe it takes the patient out to his office manager or the girl that makes a reservation and say, let's try and get Keezer and Mrs. Joe together. Can you just ask that again? I'm not sure I understand that. I'm wondering if you educate the office so that we talk about making it easier, that the doctor can walk out with the patient and say, I want you to see the receptionist, make an appointment for three months from now or two months from now, but also I want her to set you up with Keezer or give you the information for Keezer. Yeah, so the question is um, essentially who else do we involve in that in that process? Is it just the doctor and the patient? Uh, no, it's anybody else who would be involved in that, whether that be admin staff, whether that be the clinic nurse, uh, whether that be the surgical assistant, um, whether it be... I can think of an example of uh, a doctor in Sydney who does um, DEXA scans uh, and VO2 max tests for a lot of executives. And he does that uh, with exercise physiologists. And all they do is assessment. They don't do any interventions at all. So in that case, uh, we invited both the doctor and his exercise physiologist in because both of those people are involved in the care. The title of the person is completely irrelevant to us. We're just trying to help everyone involved in, in the team. Great. All right, Bill. Yeah, I have a question. I'm going to presume, assume that you're using medical medics for the long run. Yes. Okay, so if that's the case, my question is, do you first do range of motion and static strength tests? And if you do, please explain why you think that's important. <clears throat> Before you do dynamic exercises with a patient, yes. do you do range of motion and then a static strength test for a baseline? Okay, yeah, okay. I got you. So the question, the first part of the question was, do we use the medical uh, lumbar extension? The answer to that is yes. The second part of the question was, do we do uh, static testing before we do dynamic exercise with people? The answer is yes and no. 
So if someone is acutely sore, we don't test them before we start dynamic exercise. The reason for that being that it's a maximal test and we, in our experience, have seen some people flare up to that if they're acute. Keeping in mind again, I'm a physiotherapist, people are coming in to see me when they can't stand up straight, they, they can be really, really sore. So we're getting the really acute stuff. Um, but we would aim to test as early as possible in the spinal program. And if someone came in with chronic back pain, but not an acute recurrence of it or an acute flare up, then yes, we would test someone, um, work out their strength, calculate their dynamic training weight, and then start them training after that. So my understanding is that from all of the reading that I've done is that we apply the training protocols uh, exactly as described uh, in the MedEx literature that came out of Florida and that has been passed on to Kieser Europe and passed on to Kieser Australia. The only difference being that we we see more people in more pain because we're primarily I'm a physiotherapist as opposed to primary entry being for people to do strength training at the start. That piece of equipment and the research done on it is so strong and so good. I, please don't think I'm sitting here saying that I changed anything. We've just applied it really well with a slightly different patient group. All right. Any other thickies, Jeff? Oh, Richard? Tim, do you have any sense whether or not anything like this is happening in America outside of our businesses? Do you know many physiotherapists in the United States get filled with traction around what you're doing in Australia at all? Richard's question was, uh, am I aware of uh, any physiotherapists in the States um, doing the same thing that we are? I would say I'm aware right around the world of physiotherapists thinking in the way that we are in that exercise and strength training is, a, is the, the cornerstone of physiotherapy going forwards. Um, I'm not aware of anyone else who's made the investment into the resource and the education so that uh, they've set up a facility like ours. Not on scale. So right around, right around Australia, there's some awesome physios who have set themselves up inside of really well-equipped gyms and, they do, and they've got a good strength and conditioning background and they do a great job. As far as I'm aware, there's only, I think there's only us who's doing it um, over multiple locations. So I imagine uh, probably the same is happening in the US, but my US experience is limited uh, to hanging out with Luke up here and Jim Flanagan down in Florida. So maybe I'm not the best credential to answer that question. <laughs> Anyone else? Vicky, did you have one or no? Oh, actually, I was, I was interested in the medics equipment and um, I was going to ask you about the protocol and you had mentioned that you followed the protocol but is that the 10 seconds on and off? So the protocol for us on the lumbar extension is that we use a four second concentric contraction, mm -hmm. two second hold, four second eccentric, two second hold. We do that with every client and we do that on 90% of our machines. Anyone else? You just put it all back on me. Oh, yes. Um, do you do any type of um, pre session intake, like a pre exercise questionnaire or an orientation or maybe even just a physical assessment? In other words, the first time the client walks through the door, do, do you do any type of orientation or are they just, do you get all the information you need from the referral and you're just kind of going right into the program? How does that work? Sorry, sir, I didn't catch your name. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Jonathan, Jonathan Gray. Uh, so Jonathan's question was, uh, before someone starts an exercise protocol at Kieser, do they do some type of intake questionnaire or intake assessment? Uh, and if I didn't convey this uh, before, uh, my apologies, because this is a really important part, is every person who comes into Kieser has an hour with one of our physiotherapists and we will start with a subjective question subjective assessment to find out all of their history of this condition and any other ones. We'll then do an objective movement assessment for us to try and diagnose what the problem is and 
only at the end of that would we then put them on exercise on the exercise so um, in Australia um, Kiza operates as a physiotherapy clinic so if s- someone can walk into our clinic with a uh, a rolled ankle from a game of Australian football and just like any other physiotherapist we'll address that by assessing ligament ligament laxity and, and taping it up for stability we even look after uh, old men who rupture their Achilles um, as well <laughs> let's go and and we do that and they're diff- they're very difficult those patients let me say stubborn and hard to deal with but <laughs> But we, we look after them as any other physical therapist would. But when it, comes to, when it comes to exercise, we have a focus on exercise. So we would start someone uh, earlier on exercise than most people because we know early intervention works. And I think a really big difference is, that, is the progressive overload that we apply. There are lots of physios who are giving home programs and who are giving out TheraBand. And that is really important. And it plays an important role in early rehab. But I'm so fortunate to have 40 pieces of the best strength training equipment in the world outside of my door. So when someone has progressed beyond stage one, and they might even be pain-free at this point, Jonathan, but I'm able to continue to progress their strength and so we can get people you know, back to sport and, and back to activity. The, the focus for us is certainly about why has that patient come in not what pain do they have or what's the diagnosis on the doctor's referral. It's not about that at all. It's what actually was it that brought that patient in. Like, you know, my mum injured her back. Her doctor told her to go and have surgery. I refused to let her go. And she was back playing tennis within 12 weeks. And that was such a powerful thing for her to see. But the goal for her from day one was tennis. It wasn't the pain. She would have played through any pain if she could keep playing tennis. It was what, you know, what's the thing that she loves? Awesome. Anyone else? Question? So I wanted to ask you this because you seem so passionate about this when we were prepping. Um, and I'd love to hear how uh, you deal with specific injuries, obviously related to uh, back pain. So go ahead. No, sorry. I was just pointing at that Achilles in the front row. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, so disc injuries, post-surgical patients, stress fractures. Um, how do you utilize the lumbar extension? And what does that training look like? Maybe you could even talk about when you first have an individual with one of those issues. How do you communicate with them? What do you ask? What kind of questions do you ask? And what does the protocol look like? Maybe you could do start to finish some of that. Yeah, right. Remember? How long have you got? Do you yeah, want to do it? You want to I do understand it's going to take a while. Okay. So. So um, back pain is a really interesting one. It's, um, it's important to understand that most patients, 99% of patients will come in and they'll say, oh, I've hurt my disc or I've hurt my joint um, or you know, I've got facet joint arth- arthritis or something like that. What we know as research-oriented um, physiotherapists is that um, 80% of lower back pain is non-specific and cannot be localised down to one single um, part of the anatomy where the pain's coming from. And so we have a responsibility as practitioners to try and educate patients that just because you're 50 and you've got a bulging disc doesn't mean that your bulging disc is causing your pain. In fact, most of your mates who are 50 who don't have back pain also have a bulging disc. And most of them also have arthritic change in their spine. It's the equivalent of saying of having a wrinkle on your face. It's unfortunate, but it's a sign of aging. That's a really hard conversation to have with a patient. And I think that's where the testing on the um, the medical lumbar extension is so powerful because I can say to patients, whatever's happening in your spine or wherever the pain's coming from, What we know is that if we get you stronger, your pain's likely to come down. Am I going to cure the disc or the arthritis that's in there? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter. That's a really hard thing for patients to change because if they've had an MRI and they've got this diagnosis, then sometimes they get 
attached to it. And there was a really good series of articles um, published in, I actually can't remember, it was, I think it was published in Lancet, it might have been published in Nature, but I think it was Lancet by Rachel Bookbinder. I never get her name right. But what Rachel talked about was that MRIs in lower back pain are actually iatrogenic. If you have... What does that mean? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll get Sorry. to it. Yeah. So it's basically where a medical intervention um, increases the likelihood of you having a bad outcome. So if I have a patient and I send them... They come in with back pain and I send them for an MRI and that MRI shows that they've got a disc bulge, then they get so attached to that diagnosis it increases the likelihood of them having a bad outcome in the long term. So we now use and if you haven't read this series of articles you definitely need to there's about three of them we'll link it up in the show notes as well um in the last five years i honestly would have sent less than five patients for an mri oh. and in the previous 10 years I, I don't know the number but i was doing it i wasn't doing it twice as much i was doing it 10 times as much the We need to understand that pain, and we could definitely do a whole podcast episode on pain, but we need to understand that pain is not just an anatomical experience. It's an emotional experience. It's a protective response from your body, and it takes into account all different things. If you're stressed at work, you are more likely to have back pain. Not because you're tired, not some physiological response because you're tired, because you're more stressed. Your body's wet more, your central nervous system is more wound up, you're more likely to have anxious responses and you're more likely to get pain. So I know that that hasn't gone anywhere near answering your question. No, it has. It's a great, Lawrence. it's a really important point. But yes. hope, hopefully it just it gave you some insight to what we think about as physios. Yeah. It's a jumping off point, actually, what I want to ask you, and we'll certainly get more questions in a, in a moment. So going from there, you know, you've had that conversation, you've obviously we're most of us in sort of strength training. You know, we know where the boundary is. When, you know, we're not necessarily all experts. Some of us might be experts in sort of pain, right? Because pain, like you alluded to, there, is so complex. Yes. So by giving kind of the cursory view like you just gave might be a way to kind of really empathize with that client and help them understand what they need to do. Let's say you've you've won them over. They want to move forward. Yeah. Let's start talking about how you would deal with this. Maybe, well, maybe you've already answered it. I mean, I, we listed a few things there. Disc injuries, uh, for stress fractures, bulging discs. Does the protocol really change all that much? Like, can you talk, uh, speak to that a little bit? Like, what does a protocol look like when they start on the LE? Yeah, um, there are depending a cu- on the out, depending on the presentation. Yeah. yeah. So there are a couple of guidelines that we that we definitely have. Um, if someone has a di- acute disc flare up, um, which I could broadly say is a flexion biased injury, so they when they try and bend anything that requires bending they get sore so standing up trying to touch their toes someone who gets pain when they sit down for a long period of time so it's a flexion bias Um, we wouldn't take them beyond 36 degrees on the medical lumbar extension to start off with if they were acute and if they had chronic symptoms of that we wouldn't take them past 54 degrees to start off with and there that's based on our clinical experience Sorry, one interjection. If someone yes. is experiencing severe acute inflammation, will you just leave it completely and wait maybe a week or two? Do you is it, do you ever do that? Is Not put them on the. Well, if someone comes into you and like it's, you know they're really in some pain. Yeah. And like severe pain. Yeah. Does that change anything? So Would you still it, do that? It, with, yeah, go ahead. If it was their first um, presentation, yeah, then I might just do physiotherapy that right, session. Right, right. Yeah. Um, not do any of the exercise. So I think the phrase I used before is I'll get them onto the lumbar extension uh, as soon as I can. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, m- most of the time, that's quite early in session one or two, but sometimes it could be session six or session eight for someone who's really acute and non responsive to treatment mm-hmm. as well. If they were, say, if they were in the middle of their uh, spinal program, Um, and they were having a flare-up, which is normal. Like People don't linearly progress out of pain. Uh, If they came in with a flare-up, then I'd have a clinical decision to make. I've definitely, even when someone's acutely sore, I've put them on and got them to get their muscles to fire to try and build stability, and I've moved them passively through range, but that's such a on-the-spot clinical decision uh, based on so many different factors um, a lot to do with the patient and their confidence and psychology as well. Okay. Uh, 
If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to interject. Yeah, go ahead. Just before that, that question, just um, you asked me about um, disc injuries. And, yeah. and the other one is um, kind of stress reactions or spondylolisthesis or something like that. And so they're extension biased type injuries. And I'm not going to try and teach everyone to be a physiotherapist in a um, 55 minute podcast. But if you do have an extension biased injury, um, like a stress reaction or a spondy, then we limit people's range into extension. So for us, our clinical experience is that beyond 12 degrees is where people start to see more symptoms. So we just take, we definitely still put them on. They respond fantastically. In my personal clinical opinion, one of the conditions that responds best to the medical lumbar extension is stress reactions in adolescent athletes. We've just seen some fantastic results. Um, for those guys but we don't take them back beyond 12 degrees okay so you're kind of just looking as i know many of us do looking for that pain-free range of motion so adjusting how much flexion how much um, extension there is with an individual can quite quickly feel out what that individual's capable of and what they're going to be comfortable doing yeah lawrence the only thing i would add to that is i'm certainly interested in their range of motion on the equipment but there's often times where someone can move a long way on the equipment. Okay. And as a clinician, I, I look at them and I, I look at their history and how they've responded to movement before or how they've responded to movement in the last week and I shorten that range. And I go, I'm, I'm just not going to take you through that really big range because on the, on the LE, you're, you're stable. Often people move better on the LE because you're in there and you're isolated and your pelvis is being held together quite tightly. So I, I always err on the side of caution if I feel like someone's been a bit sensitive or irritable is the um, the word that we would use um, to pain before. Okay, that's good. Go for it. Uh, Paul Truesdell of Discover Strength. Um, what is, so it sounds like you have two different populations of workers. You have your PTs and then you have like your strength coaches. What is the communication aspect between those two populations, if there's anything? Uh, Kind of the, the curiosity here is, for instance, we don't have PTs obviously on our staff, and P, that's kind of a third-party source for a lot of clients that they have a PT. And sometimes they'll come, a client will come in, and a PT has given them kind of conflicting advice, or like the communication's a little off. So, what do you guys do? That where's the integration talk between those two? And where's the boundary? Kind of yeah, I love this question. So the question is, we have uh, physiotherapists and exercise scientists in Keys, Australia. We do have a third profession, which we call exercise physiologists, who are specialists in, uh, let's call it metabolic chronic conditions. So physiotherapists more focused on musculoskeletal, exercise physiologists for us, metabolic. That's another long story. But what's the communication like between our professions? Good when it's good and bad when it's bad. <laughs> no, it's something that we focus on a lot because the best experience for our clients is when our physios and our exercise scientists are sharing information really well. And three of our exercise scientists sitting in the room um, down the back. So you can ask these guys this question uh, later on. That model of our physios and our exercise scientists working really well together is the model that we have applied to medical professionals. My question to you would be, does it really matter if the person's in the room or if they're down the road in another clinic? The answer is, well, one requires a face-to-face -face conversation and the other one requires a phone call. For us, and I'm speaking as a health professional, we need to get better at collaboration and that's one of the things that's that is going really well for us is us trying to help doctors and help surgeons for them to be able to fulfill their rehab pathway these guys know the research they, they know the evidence they're, they're looking for someone to be able to partner with so we have a huge amount of interaction between our physios and our exercise scientists in the clinic and that's both formal um, and informal and the more of that interaction that happens, the better outcome a client gets. And it's, I, I think it's a really big reason why people choose to work at Kieser as well, because as an exercise scientist, you get to work really closely with physios. And as a physio, I'm not just treating people who are in pain and seeing them again three months later for the same pain condition, actually helping their long-term health. That collaboration internally and externally 
is something that really makes us different. Anyone else? Yeah, Lisa? I'm having trouble forming this, but um, taking what you do, which is so unique in so many ways, um, to people, as you were mentioning, that don't have physical therapists in their studio, what do you do when you have, I have several people with back issues, um, and I don't feel qualified to go past what my knowledge base is at this time to um, push them in any way because I don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of times they're seeing orthopedists and they go and get injections. And I don't know what that means in terms of me working with them. Are they now not feeling pain, but are we going to do something that's not good for them? Like, how do you deal with those? That's questions? a great question. So the, the question is, um, if you don't have a physical therapist in your studio and you have let me start big and I'll go small. And you do, you have patients with pain. How do you, how do you approach it? Um, first thing I would do is pick up the phone and I would call their physical therapist or their orthopedic surgeon or their doctor. And when you call the right uh, physical therapist, the right doctor, they'll answer the phone and they'll work with you um, to help you get the best result for the patient. The other thing I would say is congratulations for... Um, taking into account what is your scope of practice. And I think that's what makes a lot of people in this room different to, let's call it the gym industry, where you know you realize that that patient first and foremost is the most important thing and not just progressing them for the sake of, of progressing them. To get more specific about what should you do in that situation is really tough because there are patients that I would comfortably push really hard in that situation from an exercise point of view and there are patients that I would tell them to have the week off this exercise and we'll just go and do those ones. What I would do in every single situation, because keep in mind my bias is to getting people to do exercise long term, in every single situation I would try and educate that patient that they can still move and they can still do some exercise. Because what I don't want is for that patient to give up exercise every time they have an episode of pain. And that's what a lot of people do. They'll call up and they go, oh, I cancel. People will cancel their physiotherapy sessions because they're in pain. <laughs> And I'm like, do you realize what you've just done? I am the person that you should come to for advice so I can help you move again. And I was not always so patient as a clinician. Often I was a bit of a border gate and I would call them up and I would say, no, this is the way that it has to be done. Whereas now my approach is, I just want to make that person 1% more educated every week and make them 1% stronger every time that I possibly can. And I now have to get comfortable with the fact they may not have the same belief as me today, but if they're a little bit closer to a healthier belief tomorrow, then I'm okay with it. Let's take one more question. Okay, I was just gonna follow up. If somebody um, is getting on, let's say a leg press and they have a, a back condition and they've got some injections and it hasn't really worked. Um, and you talked about doing very lightweight with people like that. So if this person was able to do a relatively heavy weight but suddenly it's bothering their back, is that something you get off of or you just bring that weight down a lot or is it just very individual? It's probably very individual. Yeah, it's a, that, that's definitely an individual yeah. um, answer because I can think of a number of situations, again, where I would go one way and then I would go the complete opposite way. So maybe we can have one more question that yes. isn't quite as individual as that one if anyone else has got one. One final question. Yep. Um, well, I was going to ask you a very good question. Um, I'm just curious. I know a lot of us here don't have the you know lumbar extension, the medical version. Yes. Probably most of us here probably have at least the core lumbar extension. What's your views on using that instead of the medical for you know the purposes of strengthening the lower back? Is there limitations? Well, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a it's an awesome piece of equipment, um, unrivaled by any other piece of equipment that I've seen out there. I, know I haven't trained on everything. That's why I'm over in America to learn from you guys and see more equipment and learn other stuff. But um, it's not as good as the medical piece of equipment um, for a number of reasons. The restraint system isn't quite as tight. The counterweight isn't as specific. Um, so in my mind as a clinician, all I would then do is I would be more conservative. So it's the okay. medical lumbar extension is so specific 
um, that I can control everything to within one pound or to within three degrees or to within a quarter of a turn of that counterweight. I feel like I'm in control. On the, um, the exercise version, you can't control as many things. So it's always risk reward for me. If I'm not in control of everything, I'll take a few less risks. That's how your mind works as a, it should work as a clinician. Um, that's why I don't need to push people really hard to start off with because I need to think about, okay, where do they need to get to long term mm -hmm. when I can see the reward? Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, Tim. Thanks, everyone. This has been fascinating. <laughs> no one left the room. Uh, so just to, just to wrap up, obviously, if you want to learn more about um, Kisa Training Australia, kisa-training.com.au, I think. No, just Kisa. Just kisa.com.au. Okay. Overcomplicated that, didn't I? <laughs> um, thanks to Resistance Exercise Conference. Thanks to Discover Strength. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. Great to talk to you. Um, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe on YouTube. Um, and to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 405. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Hey, before That's we it. jump up, before we jump up, let's just say um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lawrence. Between your Australian accent and your British accent, American <laughs> listeners, you got about 80% of what you said. <laughs>